38% of companies have difficulties in recruiting ICT specialists. We need to equip people with the right skills. Youth groups say unless political leaders take positive action, the next generation will not need to manage the European Union because it won't exist. Jerome Hughes, Press TV, Brussels. Well, at times it has been ranked the safest city in America, but tonight a double murder in a quiet Irvine community has many neighbors worried tonight. It happened earlier today at a home on Crystal Circle off of Culver Drive. KCAL 9's Stacey Butler is there live with the very latest tonight. Stacey? Well, Jeff, still a lot of detectives out here behind me as they try to figure out just why this happened. Neighbors can't help but worry. I thought Irvine was like the safest city in California, but not anymore. On a quiet cul-de-sac in one of the safest cities in the country, gunshots shattered the silence on this street in Irvine and this mom's sense of security. We pay a lot of money to live in the city of Irvine, but it's just not, we have to think twice about this. So you're thinking about moving because of this? Yes, we might move. Just down the street from Wafa Lamri's home, police say 37-year-old Nolan Pillay shot and killed two family members at 1 o'clock today in what they're calling an act of domestic violence. Neighbors describe Pillay as depressed. Police arrested him at the scene. He didn't put up a fight. They've lived there for about 15 years. It's a father with his two adult sons. One neighbor heard screams from inside the home. He heard some, some yelling. He heard um, somebody yelling, sorry, sorry, um, and that was it. While some feel uneasy in a city that's supposed to be known for its safety, others say they don't feel threatened, just sad for the family. That was like a family homicide. It's not a terror attack. It's not somebody that just stormed and shot people randomly. I mean, that was meant to be, and it was inside their home. So Irvine's still a very safe city. And police are not releasing the names of the victims until they notify all the family members. That's the latest from Irvine. Back to you guys. One of the issues that could make it all the way to the Supreme Court is the president's executive order on immigration. Tonight, here, the new backlash and the White House in damage control. The press secretary today saying this was not a, quote, ban in the first place. But President Trump used that word himself, and it turns out so did the press secretary. ABC's chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl. In the face of mounting legal challenges and a growing political backlash, Secretary of Homeland Security John Kelly stepped forward today to defend the extreme vetting executive order. Well, this is not, I repeat, not a ban on Muslims. Despite reports that he was blindsided by the details of the executive order, Kelly insisted his staff helped write it, and he had seen several drafts himself. Well, clearly, um, it was uh, this, this whole approach was part of what uh, then-candidate Trump talked about for a year or two, so we, we knew all that was coming. The Trump administration is battling these images. Families detained at airports when the ban on refugees and people from seven majority Muslim countries went into effect. Lives in limbo. And now two of America's largest companies, Amazon and Microsoft, are joining lawsuits to stop the order. Speaker of the House Paul Ryan said he wasn't even told about the order until it was signed. No one wanted to see people with green cards or special immigrant visas like translators get caught up in all of this. And so I think there was, regrettably, the rollout was confusing. In damage control mode, the administration announced 872 refugees will be allowed into the country this week because keeping them out would have caused extreme hardship. And the White House press secretary said today the order isn't even really a ban after all. First of all, it's not a travel ban. I think you heard Secretary Kelly. I apologize. I just want to make sure I get this straight. But wait, the president himself called it a ban in a tweet just yesterday. He's using the, the words that the media is using. But at the end of the day, it can't... Hold on, hold on, hold on. It can't minute. be... It That's can't be... Words. Oh, tweet. Jonathan, thanks. I'll, I'll let Kristen talk. It can't be a ban if you're letting a million people in. If 325,000 people from another country can't be in, that is by nature not a ban. And Spicer himself has called it a ban twice over the past several days. It's a 90-day ban. The ban deals with seven countries. And this was the president on Saturday, the day after he signed the executive order. We're going to have a very, very strict 
ban and we're going to have extreme vetting. We tried to ask about that today. Hey, Sean, I'll see you Sean, tonight. Tonight. The, the, the president also said a very strict ban on Saturday. He called it a very strict ban. Who, are, are, was the president wrong? John Carl live at the White House seems like an obvious question to ask. No answer on that one as he walked away. But in the meantime, John, Republicans and this White House are furious with the Democrats for bringing the formation of the president's cabinet to a near halt. Yeah, they're called, they're crying foul on this. In fact, only four of the president's cabinet level nominees have been confirmed. You can go all the way back to the 1800s and not find a president that has had so few confirmations at this point in their presidencies. And today, the Democrats worked to stall even further by refusing to show up for votes on his picks for Treasury and Health and Human Services. Dave. Our top story, Iran's defense minister, Brigadier General Hossein Dehran, says Tehran will not allow any foreign intervention in its defense affairs. Dehran has confirmed reports of a recent missile test and said it has been in line with the country's defense programs, which did not violate the nuclear uh, deal signed between Tehran and the P-5 plus one group. He noted that Iran's missile program aims to protect its missile, its rather national interests, saying the country will not stop developing and reinforcing its defense capabilities. The remarks come after the U.S. requested an urgent Security Council meeting regarding Iran's ballistic missile tests. Iran says that its ballistic missiles are not designed to carry nuclear warheads, and thus the U.N. Security Council Resolution 2231 does uh, not apply to them. The document, which was adopted after the signing of uh, Iran's 2050 nuclear deal, calls for Iran to refrain from activities related to nuclear-capable missiles. Well, members of Colombia's Revolutionary Armed Forces, known as FARC, are on the move to disarmament zones in a peace process to end 52 years of domestic conflict. Nearly 4,400 FARC fighters are currently advancing to more than two dozen rural camps provided around the country. This comes as some six to 7,000 fighters are already at or near the demobilization sites where government and UN officials have been present to monitor the rebels handing out their weapons. The guerrilla fighters are also attending therapeutic art classes to try to leave the jungle ranks and go back to society. Breaking reports at the moment stating that all prisons in the state of Delaware are now on lockdown after they're saying the Vaughn Correctional Center, which is the largest prison in the state, apparently has seen this inmate uprise where they have taken over a building and some of the reports I haven't got a confirmation on this but this is a breaking 911 they're saying that five officers are being held hostage now what they are saying for sure is that they have activated their emergency response team which is like their SWAT team that they're gonna send in here to deal with this but apparently they have taken over a full building inside this compound inside this facility and at the moment, they're locking down all other prisons. So we don't have a lot of information in regards to this. They do have helicopters that are swarming. They did show a clip here over on this channel from a distance of the team gathering up front, but then they cut it. There's no word if they've cut the electricity or power to where they are. And that's key because they could be watching a TV trying to get a beat on what they're doing and that's also why some of the information in a situation like this is kept under wraps they don't want to give away their position what they're doing and let the, the guys on the inside know so to speak and they could just be sitting there watching the tv and trying to stay a step ahead of them so to speak but there was reports of smoke coming from uh, the area as well but look here Hostages taken. Smoke reported at the facility. And like I said, their emergency response team deployed. So all the prisons in Delaware on lockdown. I will continue to update as I hear more information on this. But it seems like it's in one building specifically at the moment. Attorney General nominee Senator Jeff Sessions was approved by the Senate Judiciary Committee. But there was some drama leading up to that vote. The Attorney General is the people's attorney, not the president's attorney. I have very serious doubt that Senator Sessions would be an independent attorney general. Democratic committee members made their disapproval of Sessions and the Trump administration as a whole very clear. To say that it is amateur hour at the White House is to slander amateurs. Three attorneys wrote an op-ed 
stating that Senator Sessions had no substantive involvement in the cases that he listed as being among the top 10 that he had personally handled. Republicans supported Sessions and some criticized the Democrats for playing partisan politics. I'm curious where these sentiments calling for an independent attorney general were in 2009 and 2010 and 2011 and 2012 and 2013 and 14 and 15 and 16. Because for the life of me, I cannot recall a single instance in which Eric Holder or Loretta Lynch stood up to Barack Obama. Senator Sessions' nomination now goes to the full Senate. The Cheektowanga man who beat another young man to death with his bare hands last year is now heading to prison for 24 years. That was the sentence handed down to Cody Jeffords in an Erie County courtroom this morning. News 4's Katie Alexander was in court and joins us in Buffalo with more on this. Katie? Well, Brittany, the courtroom here was packed with family and friends of the victim, 19-year-old Justin Vanderwalker, all of them looking for justice for the young man who was killed in the parking lot of a Chictawaga apartment complex last May. The man responsible, 21-year-old Cody Jeffords, stood quietly while Vanderwalker's mother addressed the court for nearly 20 minutes, asking for the maximum sentence. Jeffords pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter and was facing up to 25 years in prison. According to Jeffords' attorney, he came home to his apartment to find his girlfriend and Vanderwalker in states of undress, and he flew into a rage. And then, as Vanderwalker's mother described it, Jeffords chased v Vanderwalker down like an animal and punched him in the head more than 30 times, even though he was unconscious after the first blow. Vanderwalker was taken off life support at the hospital a few days later. His mother said she could never forgive Jeffords for what he did. The only thing my son did that day was to cross paths with evil. A vile, murderous demon. Every day of my life, I regret this to the deepest amount of my heart, and it will haunt me for the rest of my life. And I can only <coughs> wish that I could take it back. Vander Walker's family members say they have to be at peace with that 24-year sentence that was handed down today. They describe Justin as loyal, cherished, and selfless. And they say they want his legacy to be for everyone to be good to each other. They say you never know how much time you may have left. News update right now is shooting on the Loop 101 last night near McDowell being investigated as a road rage shooting. We're told the victim's car was shot at three times. One of those bullets hit the victim in the shoulder. So far, the shooter is still at large. And we've just learned there's been an arrest and a heartbreaking murder. Josiah English III, now in custody, accused of gunning down his ex-wife right in front of their two children. We brought you this as breaking news yesterday. It happened near Cave Creek in Greenway. The victim is being identified as 35-year-old Blanca Gutierrez Kelzonkit, her ex now in jail, booked for first-degree murder. Business meetings don't always get this much attention, but this one was in Mexico, which has been feeling the full force of President Trump's new approach. Much of the talk was of border walls and trade. Leaving the free trade agreement goes against the principles that Mexico has promoted over the last 25 to 30 years. Free trade is the model Mexico wants for its development and prosperity. Annual trade between the U.S. and Mexico is worth more than $580 billion. Any tariffs and protectionism could cost thousands of jobs. The North American region has been the biggest loser in the global trade in the last 20 years. We believe a strategic alliance between Mexico and the United States is the best way to compete with China. But working together may not be easy. Trump has referred to Mexican migrants as criminals and rapists. And tourist officials fear the war of words could damage another important sector. We need to carry out a campaign so that Mexicans are warm and hospitable and welcome American visitors. We cannot allow xenophobia. Mexico's government says a summit between the president and Trump is still on the cards. In the meantime, the two leaders have reportedly promised not to talk publicly about the border wall, even if everyone else is. So we had a uh, very successful event. He's a terrific person, by the way. I got to know him reasonably well before, the, before we uh, did the announcement. And he is just a uh, spectacular man. I think he'll be a spectacular. Uh, you know, you tell me, how would they go about, Leonard, how would they go about opposing him? He's perfect in almost every way. Well, they'll look for the almost, right? They'll say, what's the almost? 
Well, I, I think there's a certain dishonesty if they go against their vote from not very long ago. And he did get a unanimous endorsement, and he's somebody that should get. I mean, you can't do better from an educational, from an experience, from any standpoint. A great judge will be a great justice. So, uh, no, I feel that uh, it's very dishonest if they go about doing that. And, yes, uh, if we end up with the same gridlock that they've had in Washington for the last longer than eight years, in all fairness to President Obama, a lot longer than eight years, but if we end up with that gridlock, I would say, if you can, Mitch, go nuclear, because that would be an absolute uh, shame if a man of this quality was caught up in the web. So I would say it's up to Mitch, but I would say go for it. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Well, we understand they're trying to determine, indeed, if he was indeed armed with a gun. But right now, detectives with the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, they're telling me that around 8.30 this morning, this convenience store here behind me, the Met Mart, which, at the, which is at the corner of Prima Vista Boulevard as well as Arosa Boulevard, they say a man walked into the Met Mart here, and they say um, he had what appeared to be a gun inside a sock. Now, this is surveillance video of that man that the clerk here says walked into a store um, Wednesday morning demanding cash. Now, a spokesman with the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office, he tells me um, that deputies were here on the scene within minutes. They say um, it was kind of like a, a, the perfect storm. There was an undercover detectives, unmarked detectives in the area, as well as Port St. Lucie police officers in the area, and they were able to get a quick jump on this case. Now, in fact, after getting a description of that suspect and a description of the getaway vehicle, they were able to uh, track down that suspect who lives not far away from the scene. As you can imagine, the clerk says it was scary and he had no choice but to give up the money. He came in, walked in, and he just demanded for the money. Opened the safe, opened the safe, and uh, I just had no option but to. I didn't want to take any chances, so I just gave up the money and uh, let him go. Now, deputies right now are at the suspect's home, we're told. Um, they're waiting for a search warrant. The clerk here also says he recognized that suspect because he says he's been a customer here at this store for about two years now. The clerk also tells me that he has been here at this store for 14 years, and this is the first time he's ever been robbed.